I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episode, episode 8 of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we delve deeper into the first letter of Peter the Apostle. We learned that the whole focus of his letter was triumph and hope in suffering, and how various kinds of trials proved the quality of our faith and tested the way fire tests gold. We finished off by dealing with a very difficult passage in 1 Peter 3 verses 18 to 22. I established a few facts for you to help you understand this passage more easily. As I said in an earlier podcast series on the letter to the Hebrews, one of the biggest mistakes that any Christian can make when studying the scriptures is to jump around from verse to verse in the Bible, trying to gain an understanding from a single verse or a passage. I liken that to trying to understand the whole picture of a jigsaw puzzle by studying just one piece of it. A single jigsaw puzzle piece cannot help you understand the entire picture. All the surrounding pieces must give context to the piece in the middle. The only way to really understand the scriptures, especially passages like this one in Peter, is to read this entire letter from beginning to end, and to read Second Peter as well as the little letter of Jude, so that you can see the whole context the surrounding puzzle pieces, and that way see the larger picture. In 1 Peter 3 verses 20 to 21, Peter uses the images of Noah's Ark as a symbol or archetype of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the believer's life who carries them over the floods of judgment and brings them to God. Baptism is also a picture relating to the Ark and saves us, just as the Ark saved Noah. Baptism not water baptism, which he says, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but the baptism of the Spirit puts us into the ark of safety, our Lord Jesus. The ark delivered Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, which threatened to take their life. So also, we too are delivered from the flood of sin that surrounds us, not by water, but by the Spirit of God. Remember what 1 Peter 3 verses 18 says? For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. How can we do this? By fully immersing ourselves and identifying with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Peter finishes this discussion of suffering, exhorting the Christians to remember that though they walk in honesty and faithfulness to God, they should not live like the Gentiles do. 1 Peter 4 verses 3 to 4 For you spent enough time in the past doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in sensuality, sinful desires, drunkenness, wild celebrations, drinking parties, and detestable idolatry. They insult you now because they are surprised that you are no longer joining them in the same excesses of wild living. Peter says that believers should never be concerned about their own satisfaction and their own rights. This is what the spirit of our age wants, that we get our rights and that we receive everything that we deserve. This is the new morality, the morality of equal rights. Everybody has rights in our society. There is no such thing as sacrifice or privileges, but everybody talks about rights. Everybody is equal. Everybody has the right to everything. And if you don't give me what I have the right to, I will rebel and fight back. I'll do whatever it takes to get my rights. But this is not the spirit of a believer. And Christians must learn that and begin to operate on that level. Until we start acting like Christians and less like the world, we will have no testimony at all before the law. If we start insisting on our rights, we cancel out what witness we have. I remember reading of a story of a boy who was upset about all the work that he had to do around the house. So one morning he laid a list of things on the kitchen table for his mother to read. It said, For mowing the lawn, one rand. For cleaning my room, 
50 cents. To vacuum the rug, 50 cents, and several other things. He drew up a total and put that at the bottom of the list. His mother read it but did not say anything. But the next morning he found a list next to his cereal bowl. It said, for washing your clothes, no charge. For making you food, no charge. For helping you with your homework, no charge. And the list of all other things. Then she drew up a total and wrote underneath, no charge, done out of love. He read that, and that day he did everything he had to do in the house, without a word of complaint. He got the point. This is what a Christian has to do. He should always return good for evil. And this letter of Peter is written to people who are undergoing real punishment and have every reason to protest and to fight the injustices that they are suffering. The last section of 1 Peter deals with life in the body of Christ. It is a very helpful section for us today and starts with chapter 4 verses 7. It starts, The end of all things is at hand. If Peter wrote it for the first century Christians facing what seemed to them to be the end of all things, think how this applies to us today, almost 2,000 years later. The next word in verse 7 is important. Therefore, I remember many years ago being taught by a wise old Bible scholar that whenever one sees the word therefore in scripture, find out what therefore is there for. Remember when this letter was written, in about AD 63. It would be only seven years later when Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed and the Jews would be driven out of Israel by the Roman army. Peter would have definitely known that the end of the nation of Israel was near and that the temple would soon be destroyed. Jesus himself told the disciples on the Mount of Olives a few days before he was crucified that, Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Peter's answer is clear. What should all Christians do when they are faced with the end of all things? What if the Lord came next year? What if we are now at the end of the age? Consider this. Everything necessary for history to come to an end has already happened. Jesus has come, lived, died, been resurrected and ascended back to his Father, where he reigns now over the universe. And he is ready right now to judge all who live and have ever lived. Along with the other New Testament writers, Peter affirms that we are now living in the last days or end times. But what are we to do? Are we to panic? Are we to isolate ourselves from the world? Are we to give ourselves over to mindless pleasure-seeking? No. Peter says in chapter 4 verses 7 to 10, Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. People naturally pray when they suppose that the end of all things is coming. An earthquake induces them to pray. A shipwreck or any other sudden disaster leads them to pray. So people often pray in sickness who have never prayed in days of health. Peter tells us that we must be self-controlled and exercise sound judgment about our choices, and we should be sober-minded. In this context, sober-minded means serious. In other words, we should be careful about how we live. Our choices impact our ability to think clearly. It is better to be self-controlled so that we can pray. This is God's program for the end of the age. His purpose is clear. In verse 11, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. We should not be surprised when suffering becomes intense. Instead, we should look ahead to the moment when Christ's glory will be revealed to all the universe. 1 Peter 4 verses 12 to 14 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, 
You are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We should always see our current suffering as something temporary, which we can still rejoice in. Our present pain will contribute to that eternal moment of glory. So instead of feeling shame when we receive insults for being Christians, we should receive them as badges of honor that bring glory to God. Peter finishes his letter to the churches of Asia Minor with some final instructions. He advises the elders how to lead, how and why they should treat each other, and gives a final warning to be clear-minded and alert. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 to 9 Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Screwtape Letters, that there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. How should believers deal with Satan, the enemy of all believers, who has an agenda to bring harm to them? Peter's answer to that question begins in verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. This is the third time in this letter Peter has urged his readers to be sober-minded. 1 Peter 1 verses 13 and 1 Peter 4 verses 7. What matters is that we are paying attention with serious minds to what's going on in our lives and in the world around us. Satan can dress himself up in many guises and disguises, but here he comes like a roaring lion, seeking to drown and swallow the faith of many Christians through fear, anxiety, worry and depression, weakening our witness, rendering us useless as ambassadors for Christ, and stunting our Christian growth. It should be no surprise that we receive such a stern and vital warning against worry and anxiety, and such a strong admonition to be spiritually alert, sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful. We should know that the devil is an evil adversary, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking an opportunity to devour us. Peter clearly shows us how to overcome Satan. Even though the devil is portrayed as a lion, we are instructed to resist him. We should always remind ourselves that he is a deceiver and he is a liar. What we have to deal with him is truth and obedience to that truth. How do you stand against him? You stand firm in the faith, in the revealed word of God, which has told you all about God. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 4 gives us a vital clue here. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. There's no physical strategy that we can use against Satan. There's no mental strategy that we can use against Satan. There's no verbal strategy we can use against Satan. We do not battle Satan with human plans, human ingenuity, or human words, but with the truth of God. Verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is the key. Everything becomes captive to the truth and obedient to the truth. As I know the truth, and as I obey the truth, Satan is resisted. And whatever enemy comes against me becomes captive as I stand on the truth and as I obey the truth. There is only one way to resist the devil, and that is to know the truth, to believe the truth, to stand on the truth, and to obey the truth. And when we do that, we stand against him and he flees. What we say is not important. There are a few little gems left for us in the last few verses of 1 Peter. Peter says in chapter 5 verses 12 that he got some help from Silas with the writing of this letter. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. 
Silas was an important person in the early church. In Acts 15, he is mentioned as one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem and later on accompanied Paul on part of his first and second mission journeys. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were imprisoned together in Philippi when an earthquake broke their chains and freed them from the prison. Some Bible scholars think that Silas helped write Peter's first letter because the Greek language used in the letter was far more sophisticated than what could be expected of a Galilean fisherman. Silas was also thought to have delivered the letter to the churches in Asia Minor. The final verse of 1 Peter also has a bit of mystery. It says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now we have already guessed that Peter probably wasn't writing this letter from the real Babylon in Mesopotamia. At that time, the real Babylon was mostly in ruins, and there is no record in history or all biblical records that Peter ever traveled to ancient Babylon. However, tradition placed both Peter and Paul in Rome during this time, and both are known to have been martyred by Nero. Some scholars believe that the she who is in Babylon refers to Peter's wife, as we know that Peter did take his wife with him on his travels. In 1 Corinthians 9 verses 5, Paul says, Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? But most likely, she who is at Babylon is not a person, but a code for the Christians who were still in Rome. Scholars agree that Babylon here is a somewhat derogatory reference to Rome, where depravity and the persecution of Jews and Christians was still growing. It would have been dangerous for Peter to refer to Christians in Rome, or even name the city, in case the letter were ever intercepted. First Peter is a powerful reminder of Christian hope in the midst of suffering. Peter doesn't tell believers how to escape persecution, but rather how to endure it. He focuses on showing believers how to conduct themselves in a godly fashion in a hostile world. This present suffering is just for a little while, and as we see the end approaching, as we suffer and endure for Jesus' sake, Peter's final words to us will be a blessing and a comfort. He says, Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amidst all our trials and sufferings and amidst the world that is falling to pieces all around us, we have peace. That is the message of 1 Peter. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ. And this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 9.